Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 21 to 28. Happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way. Even if you're not Irish, you can be honorary Irish today. So um, we'll, we'll let you. So, um, yeah. Uh, Matthew 15, starting at verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Excuse me, Lord, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. May God bless the reading of his word. Sharon Atwell tells the story of her daughter, Kate, in June of 2000. Uh, she had a backache, and then she ended up being diagnosed with leukemia. She went through chemo, but... By August, just a couple months later, she had a seizure and was unconscious. Now, while getting treated at St. Jude, an infection attacked her brain. Only six cases of this deadly meningitis had ever been documented. Um, it wasn't a matter of if she would die, but when. She hung on for five months as the family carried on a 24-7 a vigil by her bedside with their other daughter caring for the home and her husband splitting time between work and the hospital. But then the autonomic storms hit, which attacked Kate's nervous system, skyrocketing her temp to 109 degrees, her, her pulse to 240, and her blood pressure to 185 over 135. When they did subside, her heart would pause between beats that left Sharon pleading for the next heartbeat. The doctors told Sharon that they needed to decide if Kate was going to die in the hospital or at home. While well, her family immediately decided to bring Kate home. Sharon was given a, a crash course by the ICU staff. Christmas came, but it was a, a subdued holiday. Sharon, Sharon's days were filled with caring and checking in on Kate and Every time she left the room, she was gripped with fear that, that Kate would slip away before she got back. Desperation and desolation trapped her. Her church, the doctors and nurses, and her husband's co-workers prayed incessantly for her. Many shared that they felt God's hand was on Kate and that she was going to recover. So she clung to those prayers and messages of hope given to her as a sign from God. By March, uh, Kate had another surgery, and the doctor said, I see miracles all the time. And when Kate got home, she started to make facial expressions, like the itchy face when she didn't like something. Uh, then she was able to nod, and then she was able to follow simple commands and then communicate with one finger. She couldn't. She still couldn't talk or see, but she could blow kisses. <laughs> months and months of physical therapy followed. Then in September, Sharon told Kate she loved her, and Kate mouthed the words back to her. Her sight came back in November. By December, Kate was eating real food. In May of the, of the following year, Kate went to her sister's graduation ceremony. In December, she wheeled the Olympic torch through 
uh, through downtown Memphis. In, in February of 2002, Kate graduated to a walker, and on August 12th, she returned to school three years after she had fallen sick. And then Sharon writes, my baby girl is growing up and growing stronger, moving boldly into her future. And I can only marvel at how, when you live not in fear, but in hope, trusting God completely, taking step after step with your hand in his, every day is a miracle. We continue our series this morning on the miracles of Jesus, and we read about Jesus deciding to take a break from the stress of ministry. He, he heads to the region of Tyre and Sidon, which, is, uh, which were city-states in Phoenicia, uh, now part of modern-day Lebanon. Uh, it was about 50 miles northwest of Nazareth, and uh, they're in Gentile country. Uh, maybe having thought it would be quieter ministry-wise there, maybe people wouldn't know him. Uh, there, and of course, there is very little Jewish presence in those areas. Most Jews, except maybe for merchants, would not want to have anything to do with that area. It was heavily influenced by the Roman Empire. Um, and as we read here, a Canaanite woman shows up where they're staying at and begs Jesus to free her daughter from a demon. If she knew her history, she would not want anything to do with a Jew whose ancestors uh, tried to eradicate her people. But in coming to Jesus, she not only received a miracle, but she also received something, uh, or she also learned something about the power of persistence. Uh, so let's take a look at, at this woman for a few moments this morning. Uh, this Canaanite woman was driven to Jesus. She was driven to Jesus. She had an incredible need. She sought out Jesus because her daughter was very sick. She said that her daughter was possessed. Now, it, it might have been something else. We, we don't see anything we don't know. Uh, but... It's her family's troubles that make her hunt down Jesus. Now, we have no idea how she even knew who Jesus was. Uh, there's no TikTok videos um, showing his miraculous work. There's, there's no posters around even of what he looks like. Um, but she hears he's come to town. Somehow she's heard about him coming, and she checks every hotel until she discovers him at the Holiday Inn. Um, it was desperation that drove her. For some, the, the only way they discover is Jesus is when they become desperate for help. Uh, they don't recognize their need until they're trapped by their troubles or their distress. Andrew Hamilton shared this. He said, the difference between desire and desperation. My aunt and uncle would like to come to Australia from Ireland if they could find the time and money, but at present they are flat out and money is going into other things. That's desire. They, they would like to come to Australia. If we want a picture of desperation, then look at some of the people who enter Australia as illegal immigrants. They spend their life savings to get on a rickety old boat to sail in cramped conditions across dangerous waters, to enter, enter a country where there's no guarantee of asylum, and more than likely a long period of detention because they desperately want something better. They give up everything to get to a better place. Mother Teresa was quoted as saying, you will never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. But even though desperation drove her, the Canaanite woman approached Jesus with respect. Look at how the Canaanite woman approached Jesus. She said in verse 22, she calls him Lord, son of David. And then in verse 25, she came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, interesting to note that the word here used for knelt 
is also a word used to be translated as worship. Now, as I noted earlier, somehow his fame must have spread across the the borders of Israel, and she even recognized his authority as Messiah. She called him Son of David. She came to Jesus as one would come to a king. And then in verse 22, she also says, Have mercy on me. Her asking for mercy was a a humble way of asking for something she didn't deserve. Did she feel she was being punished? Of course, Jesus is known for his compassion, for for helping the weak, the sick, the, the poor. And God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of grace giving us what we do not deserve. And not only that, we get better than what we deserve. Out of His fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 1, 16 and 17. If we seek mercy from God, we'll find that and more. But like the Canaanite woman, we too must kneel before Jesus and accept Him as Lord. Only then will we find mercy, grace, and rescue from our deepest hurts and troubles. So not only did this Canaanite woman approach Jesus with respect, but she also pursued Him with great faith. It took courage to approach Jesus because she had several strikes going against her. She was a woman. She was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite and a Syrophoenician. They were originally enemies of ancient Israel. And on top of that, look at how Jesus treats her. At first, he ignores her. Um, and, and when the disciples see how Jesus reacts, that he's ignoring her, they tell him to dismiss her, get rid of her. Um, and then in verse 24, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In other words, Gentiles aren't part of my mission. Now, it feels like he's trying to get rid of her because Finally, he says in response to her, please, you know what? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But I honestly think this is a test. I think all of this is like, how much do you really believe? How much do you really think I can help? And despite what seems like an insult, she doesn't give up. She keeps persisting. She responds with faith. She says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, even if all I can get are scraps, I'll take it. She pursued Jesus with a stubborn, relentless faith. She wasn't going to let any obstacle stand in her way to finding healing for her daughter. And Jesus recognized her for her incredible faith. Three schoolboys were asked to write their definition of faith. One wrote, faith is taking hold of God. The second wrote, faith is holding on to God. And the third wrote, faith is not letting go. And all three were right. (laughs) Uh, The Canaanite woman was not going to let go. She was not going to give up. And and neither should we. Someone developed an acronym associated with prayer. You may know it. uh, The word PUSH. Pray until something happens. When we're waiting on God, it's always too early to quit. Never give up praying. Even, Even when it seems tiring. Even when it feels like 
gosh, I've been praying this prayer for years. You know what? Maybe it's time to let it go. No, it's too early to quit. And because of that great faith that woman showed, she received a great reward. With how she responded to Jesus and her tenacity, Jesus instantly made the woman's daughter well. Her prayers had been answered. She got the help she had so eagerly searched for. The Norwegian theologian Ole Halsby gives a good definition of prayer. To pray is nothing more involved than to let Jesus into our needs. To pray is to give Jesus permission to employ his powers in the alleviation of our distress. Uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, Grant Stubbs and Owen Wilson were, were flying up the, the sloping valley of Polaris Sound. They were admiring the beautiful panoramic view. Then there was a cough. Bless you, Owen. For what, Grant? Your cough. I didn't cough. Oh. Then there was a wheeze and a sputter, and then the silence as their micro-light plane engine died. Both men turned out to be Christians, and they told the Associated Press that they both immediately prayed to God for help. He said he prayed during the ill-fated flight Sunday that the tiny craft would just get over the top of a ridge and they would find a landing site that was not too steep or, or in the nearby sea. Wilson said that the pair would have been in deep trouble if the fuel had run out five minutes earlier. If it had run out, that was the place to be, he said. There was an instantaneous answer to prayer as we crossed the ridge and there was an airfield. I didn't know it existed till then. After Wilson glided the powerless craft to a landing on the grassy strip, the pair noticed there were beside a 20-foot tall sign that read, Jesus is Lord, the Bible. When we saw that, we started laughing. When Jesus healed this woman's daughter, he revealed himself as the Savior to the Gentiles too. The gospel came through the Jews, and it was meant to be for the Jews first, but it was not meant to stay with only them. Paul told the Romans and us in Romans 1.16, that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We have access to the same rewards that the Canaanite woman had. Faith in God leads us to a salvation that affects us now and prepares us for the not yet until eternity. God told his people in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Canaanite woman was seeking with everything she had. She's an example to us of what persistent faith looks like. She also shows us that when God delays in answering our prayers for help, he's looking for our level of faith or, or trying to build up our faith. Lewis Carroll said, I've had prayers answered, most strangely so sometimes. But I think our Heavenly Father's loving kindness has been even more evident in what He's refused me. It should be clear by now that God is never on our schedule. But Peter tells us in his first letter to humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. God is never late, seldom early, but he's always on time. When we persist, it's then, when, it's then we are ready when he is. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you uh, for your word this morning. We thank you for the, the testimony of this Canaanite woman, uh, the example that 
she is of what a, a persistent faith looks like, of what not giving up, what not giving up pray, praying looks like. And yeah, Lord, we have no idea how you're going to answer prayers. We have no idea which prayers you answer and which prayers you say, well, not yet or no. And so, Lord, give us, give us your holy wisdom. Give us your understanding. And help us to remember, Lord, that even when you say no means you do not love us but that you love us enough to say no to whatever it might be, and that you have a better plan that we cannot see. So Lord, we, we often will lift up those in need of a miracle, and we know you still are a God of miracles. But I truly believe the greatest miracle of all is finding Christ. And there are, some, there are some of the needs that we pray for, God, in our lives, and we forget to pray that they would find Jesus. We pray for their healing, but we forget about their spiritual healing. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would be at work, that you would continue to be at work, that those that we spend time with, whether it's in our family, our friends, whether it's someone we come across, whether it's even just someone we visit with, God, that needs Jesus, I pray you would give us opportunities to share the love of Christ and not just to pray for their physical healing. Lord God, we know you're, we know you're working. And so as we... Um, continue to worship this morning. I, I pray, Lord, you will point out those areas that we've forgotten about, those areas we need to pray for, those people we need to pray for, and that you would give us that uh, one more chance to be salt and light to somebody else. And so, Lord... May the greatest miracle happen this week in someone's life. May the miracle of Jesus come to somebody this week. That, that, that someone we can touch with the love of Christ. May Christ be found by someone in our circle this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.